So the purpose of, of today's session is to provide an insight into a safe reopening of tennis facilities uh, across Wales and uh, hopefully the commencement of one-to-one -one coaching as well. Um, this is the position that uh, has been presented to Welsh Government. Um, unfortunately, what we're presenting today isn't a final position. It's the guidance that we've put forward um, that will be subject to final Welsh Government approval next week. So there may need to be um, some, some slight amendments, but we will uh, obviously communicate those to you as soon as we can once we know the position after the next review, which is next Thursday. Um, I think the important point to start with is that the reopening of tennis provides uh, a great opportunity actually to welcome new people to the sport or, or people back to the sport who may have lapsed. There'll be other sports that unfortunately won't be able to open up as quickly as tennis, except there's frustrations now that we're not, we're not already open. But, but actually we, we could be in a really strong position uh, in the next few weeks to welcome new people to our sport. Um, and that's something that we'll discuss with you in due course uh, through future webinars around back to tennis. Um, but, for, but for now, today, our first priority really is to think about the, the reopening of the sport safely. Um, and I must really stress to everyone, including the staff here at uh, Tennis Wales, that it's very much a collective responsibility. Um, venues working in partnership with coaches and vice versa, uh, and the members themselves, and everyone understanding their role in making sure that tennis can open safely. If we are one of the first sports to come back, we've got to make sure that we do that responsibly and that people uh, can see and have confidence in tennis being a sport that's safe to play at a social distance. Um, and it's really important that actually working with, with all of you that we have a coordinated and responsible approach, that we really do work together. And we really want to have a dialogue um, between Tennis Wales, the staff team here, uh, venues, clubs, coaches, to make sure we achieve um, the very best outcomes that we can. One of the things I've been really uh, impressed with since I started with tennis here in Tennis Wales is just the, the sense of community around tennis. And I recognise there are there's some frustrations out there in terms of why the sport hasn't opened up already and I completely uh, have empathy with those. But I can see your people coming together and recognising that actually, you know, we can find a better way through this, better communication between coaches and tennis Wales, hopefully better support to venues, and that will continue long after um, the sport reopens. Um, and I think my final point before we move on a little bit is, um, once we do have the green light from Welsh Government, um, whilst of course we want everyone back on court as soon as possible, um, it, it's very much going to be a, a venue's decision uh, on a date to open. Uh, and, and it should be a date that you feel comfortable with doing that with. Um, it, you know, it's in terms of you've got the infrastructure in place, you're comfortable and confident that your venue is safe to open and that people can participate in a safe manner. So it's very much about actually making sure that you reopen when you're ready to do so. And of course, we want tennis courts open as soon as possible, um, but that must be only be done at a time when it's safe. So very much within venues gift to make sure they only open when they're ready to do so. We're having the same conversation um, with local authorities as well in terms of park courts, where that may be significantly more of a, of a challenge. Okay, well, we'll move on. If you move the next slide on, please, Pam. Okay, so on today's webinar, um, you'll know the rest of the team. This is myself, obviously, head of participation, but we've also then got uh, uh, Pam as a participation development partner, Luke as well, as also as a PDP. Ellie Lewis, our coaching and volunteering manager, and Mark Lewis, our competitions and events uh, manager. It's very much going to be uh, a team effort, so uh, I'll stop, stop talking soon and the team will take over and take you through different elements of the presentation. Uh, and also that we've also got Simon, our CEO as well, who's just going to talk to you a little bit about the opening up pro, pro process and how, where we've got to so far in terms of progress, how that works, how we're liaising with Welsh Government. So that's going to be the starting point. Um, we're then going to talk, Pam's going to talk to you about the reopening guidance that we have in place and the potential startup package that we've put together for venues that we'll be sending out um, shortly uh, to support that reopening. Um, Ellie's going to talk about coaching and one-to-one -one coaching in particular and how that can be done safely uh, once it's allowed to come back. Luke's going to talk through ClubSpark and online technology in terms of how we open up, we manage booking safely to make sure that we minimise impact and maximise social distancing. I'll touch on um, funding support just at the end, just around what uh, funding pots are out there currently for people to access um, and what grants are available and how they, they are accessed and again how we might be able to support you. 
And then just to finish off, um, we're going to have a question and answer session. And I think listening on um, feedback from the COVID-19 session we did a few weeks ago, um, we're going to have a, an open uh, Q&A session. So you'll be able to ask questions and please, please feel free to do so during the session via the chat function at the bottom. Okay, We can't unfortunately um, unmute people and, have, and allow people to speak during the session. There's over 100 people on the, on the call, so it's just not going to be feasible in terms of bandwidth people dropping in and out of the call. So it will be via the chat function and Mark will coordinate those, those answers at the end. Just to reassure you as well, um, if we're not able to cover every question during this session, what we are doing, and there'll be on a slide at the end, is we're going to be running question and answer sessions next week, which we're hoping will be more interactive. So there'll be an opportunity to, to have a chat with members of the team, provide some feedback and ask for some support in certain areas. So that's the approach we're going to take. Listen to the feedback that you provided previously. Have more of an open Q&A and two opportunities to do that for you. Okay, we'll, we'll get started and move on. And I'll hand over to Simon, who's going to talk you through uh, the opening up pro process. Thanks, Jamie. And yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you again for joining us. I think last time we did one of these sessions, we had between 60 and 70 you know, representation from, from venues and coaches. And I think we're up to sort of 110, 115 today. So really appreciate everyone giving up the afternoon to join us. We hope it's a really valuable session. And you know, the, the intro I wanted to do was really to bring you up to speed on the work we've been doing with partners, with the LTA, with Welsh Government, and the journey we've been on so far to make sure we're all starting on the same page. So the most important bit is, you know, we're here to represent tennis and, and the 1,200 tennis courts that exist across Wales. About a third of those exist with you, our registered places to play. So about a third of all tennis courts in Wales are in registered clubs, our CITCs, the David Lloyd clubs that we've got. The next third of clubs are in local authority parks. So again, we've been doing a big piece of work to understand what local authority public park tennis facilities will look like in the era of COVID-19. And then the final third of all of our tennis courts are actually in the education sector, which we know is closed at the moment. So secondary schools, colleges, universities. So the work we've been doing with Welsh Government, with Sport Wales and with the Welsh Sports Association with the LTA supporting has been to look at tennis as a sport and activity because we absolutely respect that whilst clubs are able to manage their facilities and the infrastructures in place, we don't have quite the same infrastructure in public parks and in secondary schools and colleges and universities. So there's been a huge piece of work being undertaken. We've had regular dialogue with Welsh, Welsh Government probably for the last 12 weeks, um, which has been really positive and actually at an engagement level, all the guidance and the advice that you've seen going out now, I'm sure across England and across Scotland, we've been doing that piece of work equally here in Wales. So taking the latest advice from the ITF, the International Tennis Federation, the advice that we've seen going out across Western Europe, um, the guidance that we've seen from Public Health England, Public Health Scotland, Public Health Wales for us locally, and adapting the guidance to reassure the Welsh Government that actually when they do give the green light, tennis can open in a really safe and positive way. And actually, all the feedback we've had from Welsh Government colleagues and from those at Sport Wales and the WSA has been very complimentary. You know, you're going to see a lot of that guidance today. We do have a lot of plans in place to mitigate the risk. We know we can play tennis while socially distancing. Um, but the challenge we've got at the moment is that you know, the, the legal legislation that needs to change needs the, uh, the legislation for sports courts, as it's determined in, in Welsh law, um, to be removed. And now sports courts, as we look at them, includes tennis, but it also includes basketball, netball, cricket nets are in that legislation. So actually the sports courts catch-all term that we're classified in actually includes a lot of other governing bodies and a lot of other activities. So sadly, at the last review, the feedback we had was, look, the guidance is good. Tennis makes a really strong case in terms of opening up. We think in isolation it would be absolutely fine. But if we say yes to tennis, there's probably 10 or 15, 20 other activities that fall within that catch-all of us changing the legislation which would mean that we weren't able to open up. You know, the nervousness from Welsh Government was that the R rate wasn't declining, it's static in Wales, and they wanted to take a far slower, pragmatic and safer route with the public health advice, and that tennis absolutely is seen at the front of the queue in terms of socially distant sports, um, and we just need to manage the expectations accordingly that as and when the R rate does come down, you know, that legislation referring to sports courts and tennis in particular absolutely will be reviewed. So that's been ongoing. Um, we've had direct communication. So myself as chief executive, I've written to multiple assembly members or members of the Senate, including the first minister and Vaughan Gething, the health minister. Scott Lloyd, the LTA chief executive has done the same. You know, we've taken a very collaborative approach across England, Scotland and Wales 
and also Lord Davies, who's the independent chairman of the LTA, and also a Labour peer from North Wales. So at every level, we've been working very collaboratively with ministers, committee members, Welsh government executives, and colleagues in the Welsh Sports Association and Sport Wales. And so where we've got to now is that we've submitted our latest guidance, which again reflects all of the latest public health advice that we've got from Public Health Wales and the Welsh Government. And we put that forward. That paper for all governing bodies and all activities went in yesterday and will be reviewed ahead of next Thursday and next Friday, where the, the Welsh Government will review in this 21 day cycle that they've committed to, to reviewing that legislation. And again, the feedback we had from the last review was actually tennis is good to go, but the R8 hadn't declined and it was static. And as such, the Welsh Government, as you probably saw in the statement that the Welsh Government gave us, don't want to move things forward just yet. We hope the next review next week will be far more positive. The R8 will have come down. We're seeing some much more positive trends now in Wales in terms of the decline of, of COVID-19 and the spreading of the virus and testing being more prominent. That We hope we're in a good place. So I think from our work, you know, we're very pleased with the engagement we've had at every level. We did think it was the right thing to do to ask for clarification through the media last week or the week before, as it was now. Um, and actually it was really a, a, a positive piece for us in the end that actually the first minister on Friday spoke to S4C and directly answered questions about tennis on radio, BBC Radio Wales on Sunday, again, directly answered questions about tennis and actually at his 12.30 address on the Monday morning was answering direct questions about tennis and you know some of the news items we've seen today around tourism being on the brink of collapse and awaiting a Welsh government response um, about all sports suffering especially as they come into the peak of their seasons I feel really positive that actually we have had direct dialogue from the first minister right the way down through Welsh government through sport Wales everybody's aligned behind the plan we've got it's just a case of giving us the green light so what I will do um, my commitment absolutely is to keep in touch. We've been trying to share as much information as possible. I've had contact with, you know, the, the board of directors and the people from Wrexham. We've spoken to Swansea, the two David Lloyd clubs. We had a great session last night with Newport Live and their team and their chief exec, but also including clubs like Radar I've spoken to, and we've had email exchanges. Um, Cardiff Lawn I've spoken to, Dennis Powers, Cowbridge have been in touch. Um, there's a real great sense that everybody wants the same thing here, and hopefully you can see we're working towards that, and the information the team are going to come on to now We'll hopefully reinforce some of our work but again always open to feedback always keen to hear from you again we're here to represent the interests of tennis of which you guys are absolutely paramount so thank you again for joining um i will pass over to the next person the team is going to present and again uh, look forward to seeing you all back on court very soon thanks simon just before pam um kicks off and takes you through some of the guidance for for opening up tennis, just a reminder that the, the chat function is open and please um, just pop a question in there if you feel that you, you have something to ask. Uh, there was a good question early on in the chat as well, which I just forgot to mention at the start. We will be recording this webinar and it will be available to anyone, hopefully from tomorrow, um, we'll send out a newsletter. So anyone who's missed it or wants to recap can, can have access to it. But I'll, I'll pass on to Pam. Okay, um, Mike's working, yes. We can hear you, Pam. You can hear me good. Okay. Um, so just following on from Jamie and Simon, these are the things that have been put forward and it's very much in line with what we've seen in England and Scotland. Um, the infographics are very much a guideline of what's being worked up specifically for Wales, but as yet we haven't had the sort of final confirmation on these. So these are just to demonstrate what we will be doing once we get the final guidance and we'll make these available to everybody. So I'm just going to pick up in some of the areas and I know there's a lot of venues that have done a lot of work around some of these areas and it's just to sort of ensure that as a venue as coaches you're starting to put these things in place or you're just sort of revisiting and making sure that we're ready to go as soon as the venues feel that everything is in place and safe and and you're safe to reopen so um, ensure the committee oversees and maintains the implementation of the measures and we'll keep everybody up to date on what that latest guidance is. Um, activity should always be consistent with the Welsh Government guidance regarding health, travel, social distancing and hygiene at all times. And again, we will keep everybody up to date with the latest guidance. Venues must consider safety first, particularly minimising the risk of infection and transmission. Um, and a thorough risk assessment should be undertaken by every venue making sure that appropriate measures are put in place to ensure participants, staff, volunteers are protected. 
There is a template risk assessment that's available on the LTA website in the COVID-19 section. Um, and it's on the resource library. We will send this out after so that you all have sight of it. And Ellie's gonna to touch on it in her presentation. But it's make sure you go through those sections, walk around the club and, th and think about the things that are gonna be of impact, touch points and sort of where people are sort of moving around and putting the measures in place to sort of nullify those effects. Um, as sort of registered venues, you all have access as well to the uh, Welsh Sports Association website. Um, so you should have access to a login details there, but they've got a really great section on health and safety guidance and ideas. And what you will find there is a lot of other examples from other sports on risk assessments and what they've done to put things in place. So it may be useful to visit that and just sort of relate that back to your own venue. Um, Guidelines will be updated as we progress through the different phases of the Welsh Government measures and the LTA in Tennis Wales will remain in discussion with the Government and will continue to keep you up to date via email and via the COVID-19 website. Um, any measures that are put in place to enable tennis activity to resume you need to be capable of being flexed or changed quickly if tighter movement or social distancing is, put, is reintroduced. Um, or as and when um, it's relaxed. Um, facilities, as such at the moment, only outdoor courts will be reopened with indoor courts and bubble courts remaining closed. Clubhouses are advised to stay closed, but they could be opened in a limited way for operational reasons in terms of switching on floodlights. Um, they are given the, the guidance that you can access toilet facilities, but care should be taken with this because you need to ensure that, you know, appropriate cleaning and, and regulation routines are in place. All social spaces, including sort of like, you know, clubhouses, gyms, should remain closed. We need to avoid sort of places where people could gather. Um, ensure nets are maintained at the appropriate height to avoid players having to adjust them. Remove net winders. If your courts require dragging, a sort of clay, or they need drying after rain, have a nominated person to do this, or make disposable gloves and spray available for players to use. Remove any unnecessary equipment items from the courts, such as benches, such as bins. You need to minimise the amount of touch points that are at your venue. Health and safety, hygiene. Um, Ensure usual access is available to first aid and emergency um, equipment. Um, in some cases, this may be limited to the clubhouse, but just make sure there is access to this um, in case it's needed. Guidance on delivering first aid during the pandemic is available on the St. John's Ambulance website. And again, we'll make sure that you have details to link to that um, in case you need to make yourself aware of it. Make hand sanitizers or wipes available for use at entrance, exits to venues and courts where possible. Um, and clean all common touch point surfaces. So things such as the gates, door handles, handrails need to be regularly sort of cleaned um, and using sort of disposable gloves to protect the volunteers, coaches, staff at venues. Um, tennis activity and coaching. Again, Ellie's gonna to touch more on this. But it's important that both recreational play and coaching activity resumes as soon as we get the go ahead. Venues, coaches sort of working together to sort of look to what is feasible to deliver safely and how coaches can be supported to deliver lessons. Um, and limit sort of the activities um, and coaching to, to no more than two people per court um, other than where players are from the same household. And no social activity should take place. So again, it's to avoid that large access if we ensure measures are put in place to minimize the encounters between people including car parks and entrances so sort of think about your site you know is it a way that people can exit and then and you know entrance and exit at different points is there a one-way system or can sort of like lines and different things be put down to make sure that we avoid those contact points um, and consider marking the two meter distances at appropriate points such as entry to the gates or the courts um, equipment, um, players should bring their own equipment and it's advisable not to use sort of shared rackets and balls. And again, Ellie will cover a bit more about the coaching equipment later. We're also looking at bookings and payments in order to sort of make sure 
that we can have, again, safe play and we minimize the number of people gathering at the venue in the hope of just playing. Luke is gonna cover a section on Club Spark later in the presentation to sort of show what solutions we can put in place to allow this to happen. And communication, it's really important to communicate with your members and let them know what you're doing to make the facility safe. There are a lot of people, you know, that, you know, understand the COVID and they're very nervous about getting back to activity. So let your members know what you are doing to, to sort of minimise the risk to them actually coming back to your venue. Um, and some of the, the signage that we have available is make sure that once we have the sort of final versions, that that's clearly displayed at your venue. And we will have sort of a general sort of back to tennis, but there's also going to be some two metre distance in and hand washing signage as well. Um, some things that some venues have done and they've been doing because they've been sharing stuff with us is think about, you know, maybe an area, sort of a, a map of your venue sort of showing directions in and out. You know, there's been some great examples of videos. So a video by the coach or the committee showing what to do when you actually arrive at the venue and then do a walk through what they need to do. Um, and also, I know there's a lot of good stuff out there. If you're willing to share it with us, do share it with us and then we can share it with other venues who are on this call. Um, spectators and spectating should be actively discouraged where attendance, um, but if, if there's a disabled child or player, we're advising that there should only be one person per player that's there at the venue um, as well. And I would sort of consider marking out specific areas where people should stand and wait to view courts. Competitions, the initial focus during the opening up phase is gonna be on facilitating recreational and social play. Some formats of competition will be able to resume before others, um, such as local tennis leagues, singles box leagues and ladders, but we'll keep you up to date as and when these activities should resume. And currently all LTA staged and LTA approved competitions, grade one to six, have been canceled up until the 26th of July. This is gonna be reviewed from this day onwards, again, from the end of June. But Mark Lewis will communicate out directly to organizers and venues once more information is available. And then just a little bit of a thing, just to get everybody started. We're, we're gonna support venues with an opening starter pack to make sure you've got some of the basic equipment to get you started in terms of the health and, safe, um, health and safety equipment. So as you can see, we've got the infographics. These are gonna be available for you PDF to download and print off at your venue. And the reason we're doing this is that we know that the measures are changing pretty rapidly and we wouldn't be able to get them printed off and sent out in time before the next changes come in. But there will be a social distancing one, washing hands and the general playing tennis in guidelines um, during um, sort of the lockdown period. Each venue will get four times 500 mil hand sanitizers for use at court access points or entrances and exits and a super, suitable tape for fixing to the floor so that you can start to mark out perhaps some of the spectators boxes or the two meter social distancing points at gates and entrances again. There'll be a um, supply of gloves for uh, venue cleaning routines very much for the volunteers so that you can make sure your volunteer workforce is safe in terms of cleaning routines. Um, but not for general use by coaches or players and general activities. And then there'll be a supply of face masks for venues and staff for protection. What we need you to do in, to register your interest in this is that following on from this, um, this webinar today, we'll be sending out a, a video of this, but there'll also be a registration form so that you can log in that you require the starter pack and where you want it delivered. Because I know that we don't, we just need to get a good list of where we need it to get to so that it can actually get to the club venues. So if you can make sure you do that, and then um, I think there's gonna be a deadline early next week so we can make sure we can get, you know, hopefully delivery, we can get it to you before you reopen. Okay, that's me. Okay, thanks uh, Pam for that. Um, again, if there's any questions, please pop them in the chat. I see there's some flying in there, but Simon's doing a great job of fielding some of those already. Um, I'll hand over to Ali, who's going to talk through um, some coaching guidance. Thanks, Jamie. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to touch on some guidelines for tennis coaches and coaching activity for when we get the green light. These are the guidelines that have been submitted to Welsh Government 
Um, so just want to go through them one by one. So in terms of communication and venue liaison, coaches should liaise with the venue to ensure an agreed approach to activity that is feasible to deliver safely and explore how coaches can be supported to deliver sessions. Communicate with your customers clearly from a coaching point of view and regularly, making them aware in advance of the measures you are putting in place for your sessions and guidelines that they should be following when attending. Guidelines will need to be updated as we progress through the different phases of government measures. Tennis Wales and the LTA remain in discussions with Welsh Government and we will communicate with you as soon as we know of any movements and restrictions. It's important to note that any measures coaches put in place to enable tennis activity to resume need to be capable of being flexed or changed quickly if tighter movement social distancing is reintroduced in the future or when the restrictions are further relaxed. In regards to court limits, coaching sessions should obviously be limited to one-to-one -to -one coaching activity only until there's any flexibility there. Um, maintaining social distancing, coaches should position themselves obviously on the other side of the net and use adaptation to drills. How you provide feedback instruction may need to be altered to ensure social distancing guidelines can be safely adhered to. When it comes to equipment, uh, use of new or fresh tennis balls where possible for each lesson are advised. To facilitate this, consider using less balls per lesson, for example, one or two cans. Use live ball exercises and drills over basket feeding so less balls are needed. Balls that are stored for 72 hours can then be reused. If you are doing live ball drills over the net, um, if they're difficult for your players based on their level, look at adapting the drill to make it easier or to consider using the lower compression balls to facilitate rallying. Uh, it's advised that the coach should be the only person to touch the tennis balls and players use their feet racket to return them. Where players need to handle tennis balls, for example, with a serve, it is advised that they should bring their own clearly marked tennis balls, which only they can touch. Players should bring their own equipment. It is advised not to allow racket sharing or use of communal rackets. Use of coaching equipment, for example, cones and things should be limited with any equipment used cleaned and wiped down afterwards. Ensure all equipment is removed from the court at the end of the session. That's an obvious one as well. So health and safety and hygiene. Ensure usual access to first aid and emergency equipment is available. As Pam said, there's good guidance on the St. John's Ambulance website. Booking and payments. Um, operate online bookings for coaching sessions where at all possible or alternatively phone bookings. Implement a short buffer, for example, 10 minutes between sessions, booking slots or finish sessions slightly earlier to allow players to leave before the next players arrive. This may dovetail with the overall club policy on bookings during this period. Take any payments online and avoid handling cash as well. When it comes to the coaching young children, the same guidance applies for coaching children as for adults, with only one-to-one -one coaching permitted. For the red court guidance, the same guidance applies for coaching red stage children as for adults, with only one-to-one -one coaching permitted. If more, if more than one coach wishes to run one stage, one sorry, one-to-one -one red stage sessions at the same time, then a maximum of two red courts should be put out per full-size court. Adequate space and, uh, and care should be provided around these smaller courts to maintain social distancing. Um, guardian, non-participant, and Pam touched on this, attendance should be limited to one person per child where possible with social distancing strictly observed while watching the session. Please note here that a parent guardian should be present uh, for a one-to-one -one session from a safeguarding perspective. Um, and just lastly, moving on to the next slide, Pam, if possible, is just another flag on risk assessments. Um, all activities should be consistent with the government guidance regarding health, travel, social distancing and hygiene at all times. Coaches and coaching organisations must consider safety first, particularly minimising the risk of infection and transmission. A thorough risk assessment should be undertaken and appropriate measures put in place to ensure participants, staff and volunteers are protected. So uh, this is the example of the, the risk assessment that you can find on the venue resource library at the LTA. But I'd urge coaches particularly to make sure they're doing this very regularly uh, to make sure that they've got things logged uh, for the future. But that's about it from me on the coaching information. Okay, thanks, Ali. Um, just checking you can hear me. Yeah, great, because I have mute issues. So I'm just going to pass on to Luke now, who's just going to take you through the Club Spark system and how you may be able to manage online bookings and access to your courts to be able to, again, maintain social distancing and do so in a coordinated, organised manner. Over to you, Luke. 
Thanks, Jamie. Uh, evening, everyone. Um, just going to run through a few slides on the Club Spark uh, technology that is available uh, for all LTA registered venues uh, and how this could assist you with the safe reopening of your tennis courts. Um, so we're going to be having a look at uh, why having an online booking system is important. Why is this also a great opportunity for venues to use the technology? What Club Spark can do? Next steps. And then I'll finish off with just a slide on a webinar opportunity for people to join me next week to go into a bit more detail around Club Spark technology. Uh, we are aware, obviously, there are some venues out there that use Club Spark and they use it very well, which is great. This is just an opportunity to make sure that everyone has, has the information. And, and if people aren't using the technology, I'm just going to quickly go through what's, what's available through, through the slides. We can move on, Pam. That'd be great. Thank you. So why is having an online booking system important? Um, Club Spark can allow you to manage your courts effectively online for both members and non-members with social distancing measures in place which will help avoid crowding at your venue. That's obviously a key, key element that obviously when we do reopen and get the green light, how are you going to control people not congregating at your courts? Using the online platform, you'll be able to control this. It'll also improve your customer journey from home to the tennis court. We anticipate a spike in online court bookings through Club Spark. This is something we've already got some evidence on through England where, where it's, it's rocketed in terms of the number of court bookings in the last couple of weeks since they've reopened. It's also an opportunity for you to consider introducing pay and play at your venue if you don't already. This will help increase revenue for your venue and generate potential new members. Venues also have the functionality within the software to customise the online booking system to suit their needs with flexible scheduling and setting booking rules in place for all types of users. For example, you could give your members priority access in terms of how far in advance they can see the booking calendar and how many slots they can book compared to people who would pay and play. Go on to the next slide, please. Uh, and why this is a great opportunity for venues in Wales. Uh, feedback from venues so far is that online booking makes it far easier to manage their, their bookings of their courts. Clubs in England are feeding back a large increase in pay and play bookings. Some of these venues have already indicated they, they received in the first weeks of opening 100% court occupancy, which is, which is obviously outstanding. There's clear evidence that the Club Spark journey uh, to book a court works for the customer and clubs are also now sourcing new forms of income through court bookings during this financially difficult time, offering pay and play. And at the bottom there, you can see a little sort of case study there of a club in Hampshire, a small three court venue. In 2019, they generated 87 pound in pay and play income and they've already generated 250 pounds in the first two weeks of reopening their courts after, after the lockdown in England. Okay, so what Club Spark can do, it's not just a court booking platform. Um, there's lots lots of features in there, but basically the, the system can create and manage your own tennis club website. You can manage coaching programs where people can go online and, and take spaces, and make their online payments. It offers complete membership management, uh, flexibility on the types of membership packages you can include, uh, offering uh, lump sum payments or di including direct debits. There's great analysis reporting tools available for you to monitor the usage of your courts, members, demographics, etc., and take payments online. And clearly, obviously, in these slides, we're just focusing on the court ele element um, of the software. Uh, and in particular, yeah, it allows you to obviously offer the opportunity to offer public bookings or just for your members. Uh, you can set preferential booking rights for members and non-members. Um, the system will send automated and editable confirmation emails after booking courts, accepts payments online using Stripe, and it also provides an easy way to communicate with both your members and pay and play users to promote membership, coaching offers or any future events that are happening at your club. Um, so next steps, it's now really important for you guys after this, to, if you haven't already, is to consider uh, how you'll introduce an online booking system or potentially a phone booking system to have some sort of booking procedure when you, when you do reopen your tennis courts to manage the social distancing measures that will have to be in place. Because obviously what we want to avoid is, is 30, 40 people rocking up at tennis courts, all trying to play at the same time. And that's obviously going to cause tennis in general a, a big issue for us in Wales. The guidance for reopening will include considering buffer periods between bookings. So, for example, consider maybe having, uh, if your booking slots are generally an hour, we give players maybe a 50 minute play time with a 10 minute transition period. So people can leave and enter the court safely between your court bookings. Um, another, another option is have staggered start time so that not everybody is arriving and leaving courts at the same time. So you could have one court is open from 10 o'clock, the next court is 10.15, for example, just so there's a bit of space in between bookings. All of this can be controlled through Club Spark. 
um, if, you, if you're a new user, then register obviously for Club Spark, or, or if you have registered for an account but not that familiar with it, log in and just see what it can do. Um, there's loads of guidance documents we can support you with um, as well, which is quite useful. Uh, there's the Club Spark Zen Desk, which is really, really useful that I find um, useful. And there's a Facebook page as well where you can put, uh, find advice on different elements of using the technology. And have a look around at other clubs that already use Club Spark. There's plenty of them in Wales already using it really, really well. Uh, it's a great tool uh, and it'll save you hours and hours of administration work as well for your club. And then finally, um, on Monday next week, I'm going to be running a webinar session at two o'clock just to go into a bit more detail in terms of the online booking system, its full capabilities and a bit of a Q&A at the end. So this is mainly targeted at clubs that are either new to using the online module or, or pretty newish to ClubSpark who, who don't feel particularly confident. And obviously we can work with you guys and support you to help you develop an online system ready for the reopening of your courts. So following this session today, uh, tomorrow there'll be communications going out with the recording, but there'll also be details of how you can book onto this webinar as well. And that's me. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Luke for that. Okay, so there's a follow-up session with Luke on Monday for anyone who wants further information on, on Club Spark. Um, I'm just going to finish off then before we go to the Q&A with just talking through um, some funding support opportunities. Um, we've touched on many of these before, so I won't go into great detail. Uh, and a number have been in the public domain for some time, but just as a, as a recap and a refresh for anyone who feels they may need some financial support over the next uh, coming months in different guises. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk through are just some Sport Wales opportunities. Um, you'll be well versed, I would hope now, with the Sport Wales Emergency Relief Fund. Um, this is uh, this is uh, aimed at not-for-profit sport clubs in need of immediate financial assistance, and that's the key with this one. The grant was very much about actually sport clubs at risk of, of folding or going out of business as a consequence of the COVID-19 situation. So it's very much about um, su survival and making sure sport is able to continue and come back further down the line. Um, the, the maximum award from the ERF is £5,000 in terms of a grant and the clubs who do apply, um, the application is generally approved or you find out a decision within 10 days in terms of uh, from your point of application. Um, the, the fund is due to close imminently because it's going to be, um, it's going to be overtaken or replaced um, in terms of the Be Active Wales Fund, which I'll come on to now. So I do feel if you feel that you need some emergency support, as I said, it's very much about the here and now, then I'd be looking to make an application to the Emergency Relief Fund um, ASAP and imminently. My understanding is from Sport Wales that fund will, will close at the end of the month and any outstanding uh, grant funding will move to the the Active Wales Fund, which I'll talk about now. And again, just to, to reiterate, at any point, if you require any support, help or advice with funding, then the team is here to do that. Uh, and, you know, it's very much our role to make sure that uh, the tennis is able to survive and prosper moving forward. Um, Sport Wales Be Active Fund then is quite an exciting opportunity. It's going to be launching in early July. I don't yet have a, a date from Sport Wales and it will provide grants of between £250 and £50,000 to eligible sports organisations. Again, I don't know the eligibility criteria at this point in time. Uh, I have a webinar with Sport Wales on Monday. Hopefully we will find out more then. And as soon as I'm allowed to pass on that information to, to the Tannis family here in Wales, we'll make sure that we do that so people know if they're eligible and start to consider if they're going to look at this grant. Um, the, the, the focus of this grant is going to be on protect, prepare and thrive. And what does that mean? <laughs> okay, so in terms of protect, it's kind of an extension of the emergency fund. So it'll be about short term um, need, if there is a financial need to make sure organisations remain in place. So that's the protect element. The uh, prepare element will be about reopening your sports facility or your sports club. So are there new programmes or projects you want to put in place to attract new members? or activities that you want to run. So there'll be some sports element funding there from that perspective. Uh, and then also the five element then is again actually about how, how your sport, your club, whatever it is, your program can grow and extend itself moving forward. And I do think for, for tennis, this is a great opportunity given that we're likely, as we know, to be a sport that opens up early. So there could be some good opportunities here once we've opened up safely and everyone is comfortable, of course, that's the priority, to think about actually what investment or grant funding you may want into your, into your club to help you grow further moving forward. 
Um, so far, um, I have a feeling of, um, from the information I've had from Sport Wales that there will be a, a broad approach to eligible funding items for this grant. Um, and facility upgrades have been mentioned in the initial briefings that I've been to. So please don't take that as a, we could, we could apply for facility funding, but certainly the initial briefings I've had, they said it's a broad, uh, it's a broad uh, church of things that you can apply for, and the facility upgrades could potentially be involved. So if you think about this funding, they're looking at bringing together um, the uh, community chest development grant and the places for sport funding you may have been aware of which was due to open but didn't due to COVID-19 so those type of sport development outcomes and growth of the sport and development of sport are things that will be potentially supported by the Be Active Wales Fund it'll just be under one pot as sport re-emerges from the COVID-19 situation. As I said earlier when we have more information we'll of course share this as, as quickly as we can. Just moving on to the bottom two then, in terms of the remaining areas of LTA support uh, available. Um, one is the LTA Venue Hardship Fund. Again, it's been open a little period of time now. Um, but this fund is available to all registered venues that were registered on or before the 1st of March this year. And it, it offers uh, a simple unsecured financial support um, of between 1,000 and 5,000 pounds to venues. Um, this will be repayable over a three year period interest free and, and repayments won't start until approximately uh, one year. So there'll be a one year repayment holiday and then payments made over the next three years to repay any funding that you have. This pot is currently still open and there's funding available. Um, and the fund will close provisionally at 5 p.m. on the 23rd of June. So this is an opportunity recognizing that, uh, that it is loan funding and would need to be repaid but certainly at certainly preferential, preferential rates and with you know, some quite clear support from the LTA, it's an opportunity I'd urge venues to consider if you feel that you need additional financial support. We were going to talk about the LTA Coach Hardship Fund, which opened on Monday at two o'clock. Um, One million pounds available there to coaches um, in a similar financial support package uh, via repayment. But within uh, 24 hours, that fund was, was exhausted in terms of, of coach applications. Uh, speaking to Ali, um, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that a number of Welsh coaches who had expressed their need for financial support managed to, to apply for that, but that fund has been exhausted now. Um, but they are currently still taking uh, expressions of interest. So if you feel that you do need support, and there is an opportunity to express that via an expression of interest, but at this point in time, the pot unfortunately is empty and there's no guarantee of additional funding, but, but please do get an expression in if you feel that you, that you need to. The only other thing I just wanted to flag um, here, it's, it's not quite around funding, but it went out on the newsletter last Friday is we had a number of requests around um, tennis balls from coaches um, because of the need maybe to have more of them in terms of uh, getting back to your coaching activities. We've been able to, to uh, secure a, a discounted rate with with head in terms of the Wrexham shop and also YC Sports in Cardiff. And information on that is is on the newsletter previously, uh, and I'll have a conversation with Luke, and maybe we'll get that back out in the newsletter tomorrow, just so people know where that is in terms of okay, getting hold of that offer. Okay, we'll we'll move on, Pam. Okay, so I'm not sure how many outstanding questions we actually have. I know I see Simon and others are doing a really good job of, of trying to support people on the way through. I will hand over to Mark now to pick up any outstanding questions we have to answer. Um, again, I must, I must stress, we will be running additional sessions next week for Q&A, so please don't feel that you have, this is your only one chance to do so. Um, there will be additional sessions next week, uh, and we'll be sharing this webinar via by a recording tomorrow. So again, you can reflect on what you've heard from us today, think about any outstanding questions you have and ask those um, next week. So I'll hand over to Mark if that's okay. Yeah, thanks Jamie. Hi everyone. Um, yes, yeah, as Jamie said, Simon's done a great job in terms of answering a lot of those questions. And what I think we'll do is we will um, include the questions and answers uh, in, a, in a nice format along with the, the recording of this in the next few days, just so everyone can see all the questions that have come in, because I imagine it's quite easy to have missed a couple. But um, a few outstanding ones, Luke, um, if you wanted to jump back in on Club Spark. Um, I believe there is a charge for using Club Spark. Are you aware of how much the stripe cut or commission is currently? 
Yeah, yeah. I've just gone back to Alison on that one. So basically, if anyone else got similar questions on that, uh, Stripe, which is for a full payment, will take 2.8% plus 25 pence per transaction. So for example, a five pound court booking, uh, I think it brings in four pounds 61 to the venue with 39 pence, then obviously going to Stripe. So if, you, if, 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 if that you know, makes you nervous at all in terms of the fee, then I would just say consider upping that court rate to say £5.50 if you wanted to guarantee £5 income, for example. You know, there's, there's, there's easy ways around that. But that's basically, it's a set percentage and it's exactly the same then for, for coaching fees as well. It's, it's a, it's a tra per transaction fee at 2.8% plus 25p. And Luke, maybe another one for you. Um, can pay and play be set up for specific courts? Yes, absolutely. You can you can stipulate which courts are open access to public. Quite often, you'll have. I, I speak to venues who say they've got you know uh, say courts four and five out the back, and they're not particularly used that much by members. Maybe you just want to open your courts to 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 pay and play to those users. You can absolutely do that. You can manage what times it's open, what the fees are, what the booking terms are, how how far in advance they can book courts, and how many courts they can book within a certain time frame. So there's lots of flexibility in there. So. If anyone is out there that wants some of these questions answered and find out a bit more, then I'd say, yeah, join me on Monday for the webinar. It'll be great. Uh, and I can send you over some guidance documents as well. Thanks, Luke. Um, one other one I don't think has been ticked off. When, is there a minimum age for children to play without the presence of an adult? Pam or Jimmy, did you want to cover that one? Oh, sorry, could you just ask that? Uh, just what was the question again? Sorry, I missed that yeah. one. Is there a minimum age for children to play without the presence of an adult in the current situation? Well, I would urge absolute caution. I mean, I think we will need to go and get clear guidance from Mark Vaughan, our safeguarding officer, who's not on the call. But I think in this situation, in terms of uh, coming, opening up and reopening the sport, I think it's essential that any child under the age of 16 uh, has, a, has a parent uh, with them at all times when they're participating in tennis. And coaching opportunities but we'll get a clear answer from Mark Vaughan our safeguarding officer for you for you on that one thanks um, question that's been asked a couple of times it's just been asked again is uh, can adjacent courts be used if the uh, two meter distance is not available between them I think Simon answered that early on saying that there's not um, we don't see a need to leave courts vacant and haven't been advised by the Welsh Government around this as things stand um, Questions just been asked. Obviously, we're expecting the announcement to come on the 19th of this month. Just a question around the team's availability on that weekend, uh, just whether we're around to speak to and, and obviously support over that weekend. I think that's a absolute yes from us. Um, so we will all be around. I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone. I'm going to say if we get the nod on that Friday, please feel free to get in touch with us and we'll do all we can to, to help you be ready if it's if it's for the for the following Monday. Um, pay and play, maybe one for Luke perhaps. Um, are there any general updated terms and conditions available, including additional COVID-19 advice? Uh, we, I would, I'll go back and check on that because I'm not too sure if, if, if there's anything updated in terms of TNCs on that, it'll be pretty much following the guidance that comes out when we can obviously have the safe reopening, whether it's pay and play or members playing, the, the, the guidelines will, will still be consistent on that. I know that somebody's asked a question around insurance as well. Um, as far as we're aware, it, it doesn't change anything. It, it, you are registered as a registered venue, any, any, any tennis activity within your premises is, is safe, to, safe to go ahead. Obviously, I did see a question as well, which might answer a few others around the access of courts. That's going to be covered in the webinar on Monday. So the different options using gate access systems, using combination padlocks, for example, we'll talk around that because obviously that's a key consideration for clubs to think about how they'll control uh, the entrance and exit of, of their courts as well. Thanks, Luke. Um, question that's been asked a couple of times is around toilets. So I don't know whether, Pam, you want to jump back in. I know you did cover it. Um, is there specific guidance on opening toilet facilities? Do they need to be open? Uh, I don't know whether you want to touch a little bit more on that, Pam. Guidance, but on the original guidance, it says they can be made available, but you have to identify during your risk assessment what measures you were putting in place to make sure they were regularly cleaned. But I'll check on that. Okay, thanks, Pam. Uh, one for Jamie, Active Wales Fund. What percentage is offered, please? 
Yeah, okay, thanks. I don't know that at this point in time. Um, once you get further guidance on the on the grant, we'll distribute some information on that to, to all, to all uh, Tannis community members. And maybe sticking with you, Jamie, a um, couple of questions around legal liability and insurance cover. A uh, question that's just come in as well is what's the position on insurance for non-members, um, pay and play players? Uh, what's the question specifically, Mark, there, sorry? Well, what is the position on insurance for non-members or pay and play players? We'll have, to, we'll have to consult the policy then and be clear on, on what that is. I mean, again, it, it will be linked to the risk assessment. So, um, you know, we'll have to get an accurate answer on this, but my assumption is you're insured for activity that takes place on at your venue as long as you've completed a risk assessment and it's within the scope of, of what, you're, what you're offering. So I think it'll come down to individual policies in terms of that. Thanks, Jamie. I'm just scrolling through, seeing if there's any questions coming in that Simon hasn't answered yet. Um, what first aid guidance is being given to coaches? You want me to come in there? Um, yeah. Are we, yeah, we've touched on that a couple of times um, this evening, just to ensure that there's access to the first aid and emergency equipment. There's really good guidance on the St John's Ambulance website that we would urge everybody to, to look at. Obviously, all our coaches are uh, first aid train because they're accredited at every venue so they they should have suitable training um, but if there's any doubt in the current climate on that then please visit the St John's Ambulance website and I can get more of that information out through communication channels in the next couple of days as well to everyone. Okay thanks Ellie. I think the key point I would make around the reopening of venues is whilst we very much want to get open and get people playing tennis um, I think the initial point should be that that should be done safely. So whilst we want to work with you to open up tennis to new members and new participants moving forward, you know, I, I, you know, I, certainly in the very short term, I think venues sh should feel comfortable that they open up to their members and they feel comfortable they've got their policies and practices in place. Everyone understands that and then we'll work together to help try and recruit more people into playing tennis. I don't want to miss that opportunity, but you know, personally, I want to stress that the venues must feel comfortable that, that they can reopen safely and that and everyone is, is participating in tennis in a, in a manner that is aligned to the guidelines. Completely support people with that position. Okay, um, question has just come in. If, if we weren't to get the go-ahead week Friday, would we change our approach from, from what we did a few weeks ago? I don't know whether you want to take that, Jamie, or whether Simon's still with us. To jump I'm in. happy to happy to pick that one up. Um, hopefully, you can all hear me okay. Yeah, I think we're going to take some advice, and we are taking some advice. So I'm obviously having conversations with other national governing bodies who are in the same situation. Um, we're in daily contact with the LTA around their approach and how they can support and what more we can do, um, as well as with the Welsh Sports Association and directly with Welsh government. I mean, no one here is saying that tennis shouldn't be one of the first ones back. It purely comes down to a public health piece around the R rate, and so. We've demonstrated that tennis can be played. No one's doubting it's not accessible. It can be played on two meter social distancing. It's just purely a case of allowing tennis to come back and then what else that entails and what other businesses and, and parts of the economy want to come back as well. So I think we'll come back to you on that. I, I don't have a view at the moment. We've got a week to decide. Um, we need to look at it from a public relations piece. Obviously tennis being quite vocal and outspoken at the last review. Um, we need to look at that as a collective sports piece and, and you know, see how sport can do this. You know, outdoor exercise and physical activity is really important for people. So I don't know at the moment, but you know, we will have a plan in place like we did for, for last, the last review um, around obviously speaking to, to key partners, media, and keeping you all up to date as well. Okay, thanks, Simon. Um, Ellie, a few questions come in around accreditation. I can see one there about first aid certificates and I've also had another one just um, asking around if there's any going to be any changes in terms of accreditation because obviously coaches accreditation days are, are, are ticking by as they can't get on court. Do you have any update on that for us? Um, nothing since the LTA set that they that they would allow the grace period to fully ensure everybody until July the 31st. I'm, I'm really aware I've had lots of conversations with coaches who's who need to get their DBS and need to get their first aid done. Safeguarding can be done online through UK coaching 
uh, on an online classroom so that one can get taken care of but yeah we are aware but it's a, it's a blanket insurance cover for every accredited coach as long as they're accredited from the 10th of March until July 31st and then we can look at how we can access these things for everybody to be you know fully insured and in place from 1st of August onwards so definitely come 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 to me separately on email and any questions you have just uh, let me know and I can help you with those. Okay thanks Ellie. Um, what PR have we got lined up to promote tennis? Uh, any press release press releases that clubs can use for local media? More than happy to pick that one on Mark and yeah thanks Sophie good question. I mean we have a really strong database now as of last year the last couple of weeks has shown us that a lot more media interest in tennis which is really positive um, and we've got the LTA's PR and comms team so I think a lot of you might have seen the back to tennis campaign that the LTA are planning so they've got a lot of comms people at the moment we're able to access all that resource so the LTA have a, you know, a full comms team who sadly at the moment aren't focusing on when we're doing all the grass court season so yeah we'll be able to access any of their support if there are messages and key things that clubs would like sent out in terms of a can we help you draft your own press release to make it a bit more of a local story absolutely we'll try and facilitate that um and yeah i think you know ultimately just some of the other questions just popping up here around you know will we be reporting back on the legislation change i mean my vibe is you'll know when we know last the last review um i was having meetings with welsh government and sport wales asking lots of minutiae questions around okay if we give you the go ahead how many days notice do you need what's your guidance on this? And then we had an email on Thursday evening, the night before the review, um, asking for a meeting on the Friday morning. And I found out about half eight, nine o'clock when the rest of the country found out at midday. So the reality is, you know, the, the Welsh cabinet, the government will meet on that Thursday, make their decision, and we'll probably find out a couple of hours before everybody else. And then we're asked not to share that. It's a bit of a heads up um, to do any planning we need internally. Obviously, the First Minister will make those announcements at the 12.30 kind of press conference that he does. Okay, thanks, Simon. Um, question about, you know, pre-opening maintenance. Yes, I think that's what you suggested there, Andrew, is, is sensible in terms of bringing own equipment, um, making sure that's under control and, and kept done in a safe way. Um, another question is, would we advise gates to be open? I think that was asked earlier on as well um yeah the big thing from us there is this is this is where we say it's important to have some sort of booking system to know who is going in and out of your courts because what we want to avoid is lots of people turning up at your venue and then rocking up on the courts at the same time um so this is where um you know we'd advise maybe looking at some sort of coded padlock system that you can put in place because you can still util utilize that system through the club spot booking module as well so in the booking confirmation sy uh, settings uh, you can basically put, edit there to say thank you for your booking. When you arrive at the courts, please enter this code. What we would then advise you guys do is, is you know, is, is manually change that at least once a week just to avoid abuse, really. But um, you know, we would advise to have those courts using some sort of booking system, which, which you can control who is using your courts and accessing them. I'm not sure if Pam wants to come in on gates being open, but um, the clear guidance is that we should be minimising touch points. So again, I think it will come back to your to your risk assessment. So if you feel that on site it's it's safe and appropriate to keep gates open, that would be would seem sensible given it's a, another point, another object that people don't have to touch. Um, we're providing some hand sanitizer as part of our starter pack. Um, to help you with that so we feel the hand sanitizer whilst it's not perfect is something that you can have at court access points so people can come in the court once they've got themselves into the court they're ready to play they, they, they've, they've, they've used the hand sanitizer to, to to cleanse their hands and again I think in terms of your members I think it would be a, a prudent to to put out in part of your communications that they bring their own hand, hand sanitizer and method of making sure that they they remain hygienic at all times so I think our recommendation would be um, that you you keep your gates open as much as possible but that has to be aligned to your risk assessment and how you feel is going to be best to manage your courts and again you know if you want to discuss that with us then when we're available to do that over the next 10 days or so in terms of, of how you want to move that one forward. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I think we had covered everything there and just had another couple more come in now in terms of questions. We have a bigger workforce in other sports. Can we use this to separate us from other sports? We need to get coaches back to work. Yeah, that's... Ellie, did you want to... I mean, 
and the comment from Phil, yeah, obviously very clear that we're aware of the situation coaches are in uh, on that. I don't know whether you wanted to add anything, Ellie, in terms of your contact with them you've had over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, um, haven't got anything else to add. I mean, what, what, what the guys are racing is, is, is fair and relevant and, and, and a, real, a real issue right now. Um, so we just uh, we need to keep doing everything we can to, to see what position we can put ourselves into. And, and obviously there's been some funds allocated and not everybody's always eligible for these things, depending on their personal circumstance. But keep talking to each other, keep, keep calling and, and we just need to work through it together, really. And Ellie, I think you're absolutely right. You know, we've made it very clear to you, know, Phil, Rob, giving you reassurance, hopefully, that we've made it clear that, you know, yes, tennis is a volunteer-led sport. It's fantastic for exercise. It's gender balanced. As many men and women take part in the sport, it's great for all ages. It can be played right across the country. Um, it can be done with social distancing, but we've also made the point that we are effectively, you know, between 150 and 300 small business owners, coaches, employers, self-employed people running their business. And when these documents go forward, it does reflect the economic impact that it's having on the sport as well. And, you know, that's some of the work Jamie's already started doing with Sport Wales about, you know, we've got some tennis venues that have got £100,000 in reserves and actually a bad season isn't as bad for some of the indoor centres that are losing £10,000 a week and are going to go bust in October if we don't start getting things turning. And we've got every example in between, as you can imagine. And the challenge for Welsh Government, you know, is when with these papers coming from us, every other national governing body is doing that as well. And then we also have the, the, the narrative of, you know, tourism, um, sole traders, beachside resorts, hoteliers, everybody else wanting to open up at the next review as well. So in terms of the lobbying we've done, we've done everything directly and through the WSA. So I've had communication with the First Minister. Scott Lloyd has written from the LTA. Lord Davies has been in touch. We've had statements back. I've personally had dialogue with Welsh Government about all of our guidance, as well as sitting on every single working group that Sport Wales and the WSA have. I'm sitting on the three around indoor sport, outdoor sport and facilities. And Chris Lewis has joined our, as our head of performance, has joined the elite working group, looking at the is your elite players coming back to sport and what that looks like with the international travel and drug testing and things. So that piece of work is, is ongoing and that's been happening for, for 12 weeks. And it's really, really tough when for us, it's a common sense thing. Just let us go. We're absolutely fine. It's being done everywhere else in England and Scotland. Welsh government, as we're seeing, are taking a very you know, careful approach to, to coronavirus and COVID-19 and wanting to lift things very slowly and gradually. And that is really frustrating, I can assure you, as the person who's kind of sat here trying to get this opened up. Um, but I am also mindful of all the colleagues I'm meeting with and talking to are all doing the same thing. But we're fortunate. We have had direct dialogue with the First Minister, with Cabinet members, right the way through into sort of the, the sports team within, within Welsh government, as well as then all of the other, the other people available. In terms of your, your question, Phil, where we're looking at, again, with, with what Jamie's doing with that Sport Wales Fund, is to look at how we can bring the sport back in a positive way as possible. And we know that has a funding, can, a funding piece to go with it. So that's some of the work that we're, we're starting to do now to understand what's needed immediately. Um, to give you a bit of a heads up, you know, the LTA have now reimbursed £40,000 worth of, of registration fees back to, back to all the Welsh venues. £96,000 worth of grants has gone out to tennis coaches in Wales from the LTA. We launched another £22,500 package last week for part-time coaches that have been missed out. And now we're starting to look at the individual implications of how, you know, how do coaching providers come back without group coaching? How do we sustain indoor tennis courts when you can't have more than four people on a court at a time? So all these considerations are happening. It's just very, very difficult for you um, because you know, I appreciate you're not seeing the progress you want to see but we're doing everything we can to get as much funding into Wales as possible, as well as make Welsh Government aware of the, you know, the need for tennis specifically, so we're not a catch-all sports conversation. Thanks, Simon. R really comprehensive summary there. Um, I can't see any questions that we haven't, Simon hasn't either discussed or we haven't talked about. So, Jamie, I'll hand back to you. Um, I'll keep an eye on the chat in case any others come in. Okay, thanks, Mark. Okay, I mean, I think Simon summarised really well there in terms of, of the position. Um, we recognise fully that it's really frustrating for everyone, uh, and we we you know, we we want to get tennis reopened as soon as possible and get people back out on the court you know, to support livelihoods and health and well-being of the nation here in Wales. It's absolutely fundamental, uh, and I can only I can I can only stress probably as much as you guys are having sleepless nights as well. I'm having some sleepless sleepless nights with uh, 
uh, with the concern of making sure you could get out on the court as soon as possible. I really am. It preoccupies my thoughts every day. So um, we absolutely want it to happen next week and we're doing everything we can to make that happen. Okay, just to, just to finish off, um, Pam, if you could just move me on to the final slide, please. Have we frozen? <laughs> okay, uh, just some next steps then. Uh, question and answer sessions next week. Um, they're there uh, for you to see. So Club Spark will be on Monday at two o'clock. Uh, indoor tennis centres will be 3.30 on Tuesday. Uh, outdoor venues and tennis clubs, um, 5 p.m. on Tuesday. And then coaches will be 11.30 on Wednesday. Um, the links uh, for you to join those sessions to register for them will come out um, tomorrow uh, via a similar newsletter to, to last week as well. Um, we, we look forward to seeing you at those to answer further questions. We will take a, take a copy of the chat um, to make sure that we haven't missed any questions and we address them as far as we can. There were some, some questions that we couldn't give clear answers to. We, we don't have all the answers, so we'll seek to secure those as soon as we can. There was a couple I was uncomfortable with, with the, the part answer that I gave, so we'll go and get the guidance where we can and provide that to you over the next seven to 10 days. And please, once again, if there are any outstanding questions, anything that crops up over the next week or so, then please don't hesitate to get in touch. We're in this together want to work together to make sure that we open safely. As has been reiterated a number of times on the chat function, the, the Welsh Government review will take place next Thursday, uh, which is the 18th. That's when they look at the legislation, they look at the advice uh, and, and evidence that's put in front of them in terms of how the sport, sorry, how things can reopen and a lockdown can be eased, of which sport and physical activity is one of those things. So as Simon's alluded to, there's the lobbying we've done direct on behalf of tennis, and there's also the work that we've done in partnership with the Welsh Sports Association, the other NGBs and Sport Wales as well. So there's been two approaches in terms of our lobbying to do that. That will be considered next Thursday they will make their own decisions uh, and then on Friday uh, I believe as last time or certainly by Friday um, the first minister will um, make his announcement on potential lockdown easing and what we I think what we have to remember is that that will be guided by the science I sound like a politician now um, but it will be linked to the R rate uh, and, and how that's progressing in Wales. To the layman myself, looking at the data, it appears we're heading in the right direction. So um, hopefully that will uh, mean that uh, things will be eased. Okay, I'd just like to finish off by thanking everyone for their time. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank the team for, for their work in terms of putting together the slides, providing the guidance. Um, we, we remain open and available for support uh, moving forward as we head towards the next lockdown review. Jacques and Val, uh, have a good evening and I'll speak to you soon. Thank you.